Let's start with Dr. Sarah Middleton. Uh, the House Scholar Selection Committee is pleased to name Dr. Sarah Middleton as a 2018 House Scholar in Computational Science. Dr. Middleton earned her PhD in genomics and computational biology in 2017. She is now a computational biologist at GlaxoSmithKline. Sarah's selection as a 2018 Howard House Scholar reflects both her outstanding scientific achievements and her demonstrated leadership and character. Sarah's research attacked the long-standing problem in computational biology of modeling RNA structure from its primary sequence. She developed a novel approach called NoFold that could infer RNA secondary structures by extracting features from the primary sequence without explicitly solving the structural folding problem, an approach that typically relies on overly simplified free energy models. She then extended this method to predict protein structures. Her underlying approach allows prior information or prior collections of data to be leveraged to extract biologically meaningful views of the data from the original noisy high-dimensional sparse data. The principles Sarah developed can be used for analyzing diverse biological data that are noisy, high-dimensional, and sparse. Sarah is also a tireless advocate for computational biology and, more generally, computational science. In 2013, at the University of Pennsylvania, she, rec she recognized the need for an introductory programming curriculum for the graduate students in the biomedical program. Under her own initiative, she started a programming boot camp, created all the course materials for the eight-day course herself, and initially de delivered all the lectures and hands-on programming exercises. The boot camp, prim focused primarily on the Python language, is now an annual event supported by the Institute of Biomedical Informatics. In 2014, Sarah led her department's participation in the Philadelphia Science Festival, a week-long community-wide celebration of science with almost 100,000 in attendance. She also volunteered for the Franklin Institute STEM Scholar Program for an innovative support, uh, initiative supported by the Arthur Viding Davis Foundation to develop high school genomics curriculum. Sarah's demonstrated excellence in, in research and her advocacy for computational science are qualities Fred Howes encouraged in all young scientists. She'll be a leader and a role model to her colleagues and future computational scientists. So let's congratulate Sarah. <laughs> Great, so thank you for the introduction and thank you so much for having me here and I just want to say I'm so honored to receive this award. Um, I also want to thank the organizers for uh, accommodating to me because um, when I first found out I, I got received this award last year, I was very concerned because I was expecting to have a baby about a few weeks prior. Um, fortunately, they said, okay, that's all right, you can come next year. Um, and that ended up being a very good thing because this time last year I was very sleep deprived and in no condition to be standing up in front of a group of people and talking about science. Um, now a year later, uh, I have a very energetic one-year-old um, but who is nonetheless a very good sleeper and so I'm, I come to you very well rested and ready to, to talk some science. So what I want to do today is talk to you a little bit about what I do as a computational biologist at GSK. And as you can imagine, working at a pharmaceutical company, it can be kind of difficult to figure out what to talk about when you go to an external audience because a lot of what we do is confidential and proprietary. Uh, and the things that are not still have to go through a lot of review process and so on and so forth. So what I decided to do is to focus a little bit more generally on a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, which is single cell RNA sequencing. Um, this is a technology that has been around for a little while, but is really just story, starting to mature and is kind of entering the awareness of, it, of people in the pharmaceutical industry because it has a lot of potential to improve and uh, open up new areas for drug development. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the new challenges that we're facing because this is an area where we're definitely generating a lot of data and it's turning out to be a little bit more than we can handle right now. Um, so I'll talk about some of the computational challenges that we are encountering, and at the end I'll give a little bit of flavor about something that I've been working on specifically. So first, you might be wondering what does a computational biologist do at a pharmaceutical company? And really we do a little bit of everything. Um, we work anywhere from, you know, the earliest parts of drug discovery um, and target identification. This is where we're trying to figure out what genes are associated with diseases and also which of those genes encode for proteins that would actually be good drug targets because, of course, not all proteins are as amenable to being targeted by a small molecule or an antibody. So we help with those types of predictions. We also work in the later stages, say in preclinical development and in clinical trials. Often in case we help with um, identifying biomarkers um, 
This can be a genetic mutation or perhaps a protein that can be detected from the blood that helps predict things like what patients are most likely to respond to a treatment or maybe predict uh, how well a patient is responding to a treatment. And in general, you know, as computational biologists, we work on anything that generates data. But since I focus mostly in genomics, my main data type of choice is omics data. So this can be genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, any omics you can think of. And I think people have thought about just about all of them that we can. Um, and these are basically just, you know, when you think about a cell, we're just looking at a very large scale profiling the molecules of a certain type in that cell. My area of specialty is transcriptomics. This is where we profile all of the RNA in the cell. Um, the main technology that we use to do this is called RNA sequencing. Uh, you may also hear me refer to this as gene expression analysis, um, because basically we're, we're just reading out what is being expressed by the cell. And the reason why I find this particularly interesting is it kind of gets you more to that question of what is a cell actually doing? Because most cells have virtually the same genome, with some caveats. Um, but what really makes each cell different and gives it its function is what RNA and therefore what proteins are being expressed. And since profiling, profiling proteins is still relatively difficult, we often use RNA sequencing as a proxy to understand the functionality of the cell. Within transcriptomics, my main area of focus is single cell transcriptomics. And you may say, well, okay, isn't that, you know, what you do, you know, why single cell specifically? Um, and actually, single cell is not really the way we've done things, historically speaking. The traditional way of doing RNA sequencing is to actually take something around a million cells or more, put them all in the same tube, grind them up, and extract the RNA. As you can imagine, what you get out of this is really an average gene expression profile for all those cells, whereas with single cell, we can actually look more specifically about what is being expressed in each of those cells. And what we're finding from doing this now is that even in a population of seemingly homogeneous cells that seem to be of the same type, there's actually a lot of heterogeneity, a lot of diversity, and some of that diversity seems to be functional in nature as well. So this is obviously an area where, you know, we have a lot to learn. And just to give you a little bit of background, the reason why this wasn't done sooner is because, especially from the experimental end of things, it's quite difficult. When we do bulk RNA sequencing, what we do is we extract the RNA out of those cells and end up with quite a large quantity because we have so many cells, which then allows us to go straight into sequencing. But with single cell RNA, the amount of RNA is so small that actually if we were trying to sequence it directly, we would get probably nothing. We need to do amplification before we can actually move on to sequencing. And this is where we just make lots and lots of copies of each RNA. The reason why we have to do this is because, unfortunately, the experimental process going from molecules of RNA to sequencing library that you, know, you can actually get information out of, um, this is an inefficient process. And each step of the process, basically, you lose some amount of material. For example, reverse transcription, which is one of the earliest steps in the process, actually only has roughly a 50% efficiency rate of capturing molecules. Any molecule that's not reverse transcribed, you won't see in your end results. The entire process has many steps, and the end efficiency ranges somewhere from 10 to 20%. Um, I think they may be a little bit better now, but not much better. So you can imagine you need a lot of material in order to have a good likelihood of detecting something, right? And I'll talk a little bit more about this later because it has some uh, pretty serious effects on the data that we get out and the analysis steps we have to take to adjust for it. So nonetheless, despite these challenges, um, single cell seems to be worthwhile to do because there's so many interesting applications and new doors that it allows us to uh, op open for new questions. So just to give an example, um, in cancer, you know, you have a tumor right? And you may think of this tumor as just a mass of cancer cells, but really it's a lot more than that. A tumor has a large diversity of immune cells, vasculature, and many other types of cells. And especially in the case of things like immunotherapy, we're very interested in understanding those immune cells that are in the tumor or around the tumor. Um, and, you know, you think about this, with immunotherapy, we are trying to target it sort of rejuvenate the immune system to fight the cancer for us, 
right? And so in order to understand you know, when this works and when it doesn't, we need to get a better viewpoint on what those immune cells are doing. But if you were to take sort of the entire tumor and do bulk RNA sequencing on that, the main signal that you would get out is related to the tumor cells because they make up the bulk of the tumor. Um, you, the immune signature would be very much, very difficult to pick out of that bulk sequencing data. So a typical experiment that you might want to do would look something like this. So we have cancer patients who are going to be receiving immunotherapy. We'll collect single cells from them. Then after the therapy, we see who responds and who does not respond. So immunotherapy is a very promising uh, new treatment method, relatively new, um, and for a subset of patients, works extremely well. But unfortunately, the number, the percent of people who actually respond to immunotherapy ranges somewhere between 10 to 40 percent, depending on the cancer type. And so we'd really like to understand, you know, why do some people respond and others don't? Is there something that we can do to both predict who those responders are and also to make more people responders? So we'll collect single cells before the treatment and we'll also collect after. And then we can ask a number of questions. For example, comparing the pretreatment cells to figure out are there predictive markers of, of response, especially looking at something different about the immune cells of people who you know, do and do not respond. We can also look at post-treatment cells to see you know, what are the mechanisms that the tumor is using, the tumor cells are using to evade the immunotherapy, evade the immune system, and look for ways that we can kind of reverse that. This is already being done. Um, one example here I'm showing, this is from melanoma. Um, and what they found doing single cell sequencing was that uh, within the cancer cells, there's actually a gene expression signature correlated with uh, excluding T cells from entering the tumor. And having T, uh, T cells actually invade into the tumor is very important, seems to be very important for immunotherapy success. And so what was really exciting was that, you know, based on some other biological knowledge, they saw, hey, this gene expression profile, we might be able to reverse part of it using this uh, existing drug for a certain gene. Uh, they tested this in mouse in vitro and found that it does seem to improve T cell infiltration into the tumor. So a very exciting example of how we can use single cell sequencing to actually figure out new avenues for treatment, new combination therapies that might allow this treatment to work for more people. Single cell can also be used beyond just cancer. Um, so for example, one group ha uh, recently used single cell to profile um, a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease where they basically found a new subset of microglia that appeared to be specific to the disease mice. They dug more into this and profiled, you know, figured out the gene expression characteristics of this disease-specific cell type, found differentially expressed genes, and, oh, sorry, and um, we're able to figure out that it appears that this cell type is involved in actually, it actually appears to be beneficial in nature. It's, it's involved in most likely clearing plaques that develop in the brain. Um, but what happens is that during prolonged disease, um, over time, these cells actually get suppressed. This is sort of a very common thing that happens in the immune system. The immune system has breaks where if it's activated for too long, it tends to be suppressed because this is your body's way of preventing an overreaction to a uh, you know, some kind of immune uh, challenge. And so the hypothesis is that if we can somehow take the brakes off this cell, we can allow it to do its job and clear more of the dead cells and plaques that are accumulating in the brain in neurodegenerative disorders. I, one thing I want to point out for those of you in the audience who know a little bit more about you know, the biology here is that, you know, oftentimes what people do when they want to profile a specific cell type is that they'll do flow sorting. Uh, they'll sort out that cell type using some known markers. But this is a case where actually uh, the known markers would not have been able to identify this particular subtype because it had different, basically the different markers on the cell surface. And so this is a case where by using single cell, which where we're not, you know, biasing up front what our question is, he's saying, oh, oh, we only want the cells that express these certain surface markers. By being a little bit more agnostic up front, we are able to discover these new things that we don't know about already that can be disease relevant. All right, so, you know, a lot of the current experiments, at least that I've encountered in single cell, 
have, say, a few thousand cells. Um, and this is sort of manageable in terms of data analysis, although we are kind of like starting to push the envelope in what you know, we can handle in terms of computation. The number of data sets has been climbing. There's really been, over the past few years, as the technology for single cell gets better, the number of data sets that are publicly available is really taking off. Each of these data sets has anywhere ranging from a few thousand cells to over a million cells. I think the biggest data set that I'm currently aware of has 1.3 million neurons. This is from mouse brain. So, you know, we, the main problem that we're having here is, is really, it's not a matter of the data size in terms of disk space, because I think the total data size, it's on the order of, you know, terabytes. It's not something that's so outrageously large that we can't handle it at all. Really, the problem we're having is, um, you know, we often, with these data sets, we work with a matrix that is cells by genes. And there's about 20,000 genes or so. And unfortunately, these matrices are getting too large to just fit into memory, so we need methods that are a little bit smarter about, you know, memory management, are able to parallelize, things like that. Um, and the problem is that the methods that we use in single cell are kind of adopted over from bulk RNA-seq where we only have usually dozens of samples. So much different data size problem. And so we're in this weird state where we're trying to use methods that were designed for a diff completely different size of data. Um, they're not really sufficient anymore. So we need to basically adapt these methods or develop new methods that can handle the new you know, uh, number of samples that we're working with here. And you know, 1.3 million neurons is only really a starting point. There are groups now, such as the Human Cell Atlas, who have the ambitious goal of trying to profile all of the cells in the human body. This is on the order of several trillion, um, several trillion cells, uh, and also hundreds of different cell types. So in thinking about how are we going to get there, how are we going to make sense of that information, um, really we need new computational methods or we need to seriously look at the computational methods we have and adapt them into being able to handle this. We can also go even further and think about the human microbiome, which is uh, actually even larger, over 100 uh, trillion cells, um, and very likely has a very important impact on human health as well. So, you know, these are areas that will be very, very interesting and very, hopefully very fruitful going forward, but we're just not ready to handle them at the moment. There have been some efforts to sort of create scalable versions of, you know, our existing tools for our RNA-seq analysis. Um, and, you know, so we're on the right track, but, you know, we don't currently have the richness of tools and methodologies that we have for standard RNA-seq analysis. One nice thing, though, with you know, these larger data sets is that we're finally in a situation where we have more samples than we have features. So features, like I said, is usually genes in our case, and there's about 20,000 genes. And I could tell you, working on RNA-seq for a long time, you know, you're lucky if you have more than a dozen samples most of the time. Um, so now we are finally in this case where we have way more samples than we have features. And this does open up the door for doing, you know, a little bit, some additional types of analyses. There have been people now who are exploring things like autoencoders for dimensionality reduction, uh, looking at neural networks for things like cell type identification, batch effect correction. Um, so there's, there's a lot of interesting applications that are now kind of becoming a little bit more feasible than they were before, which is very exciting. Um, I think this is, this is an area that's still very much in its nascency, and so, you know, it remains to be seen how much uh, benefit we'll get out of these new methodologies. One other computational problem that I want to highlight, because it's really, I think, uh, one of the problems that has caused the most bottleneck for me in terms of getting, getting my uh, questions answered, is the missing data problem. So you remember I talked about how when we do these uh, RNA-seq experiments, we tend to only capture maybe 10 to 20 percent of the mo original molecules overall. Um, so uh, what happens is that depending on the number of molecules that were originally expressed, uh, for some genes it's very likely that you may not detect any molecules from that gene at all, and we call this a dropout. So for example, here uh, I'm color coding, say, all the RNA from each 
particular gene. So we have the orange gene, we have the purple gene, and the green gene. So you can see in this first step, no molecules of the green gene were reverse transcribed, and therefore we're not going to observe anything from that gene in our sequencing results. Now the problem with this kind of dropout is that we often, we see a zero in the end results, we don't know if it was a dropout or if that gene just wasn't expressed. And so, you know, we get, we get effects like this where this is what the gene expression matrix should look like, but this is what it actually ends up look, looking like. We have severe undercounting and just complete dropout of a lot of genes. People have proposed a variety of different methods to deal with this. Um, sometimes people just include, you know, sort of extra zeros in the model itself. People are also exploring imputation-based methods where these tend to work better when you have a lot of cells. So it's another advantage of having a lot of data um, where you can use information sharing basically between similar cells to fill in the gaps uh, for what's missing. And this seems to work fairly well. People are also exploring um, you know, more complex and neural network type methods for this as well. And the reason why we care so much about this, did my mic, okay. Uh, the reason why this is such a problem, at least in my experience, is I'll try to explain it here. So we have, what I'm showing here is uh, a T-SNE plot. This is just showing a per, basically a 2D representation of the cells. Each of these dots is a single cell. And you can see there's a, a clustering pattern, and as it turns out, these clusters correspond to different cell types. That's not too uncommon. Um, the cell types are these fairly different cell types, so we have things like B cells, T cells, fibroblasts, so on and so forth. Great, that all works out fine. The problem comes when you wanna to try to break down within a given cell type a little bit further. And we often wanna do this in drug discovery because as it turns out, there is a really rich diversity of different say, T cells that seem to do a lot of different things in disease. And you know, it's often not sufficient to just say, oh, T cells are increased in this disease. We wanna know what type of T cells and how are that particular type of T cell changing expression? Is it becoming more activated? Things like that. We wanna go deeper, basically. Um, but unfortunately, even if you were to extract out these cells and try really hard to, to you know, get clusters out of it, you just end up with a big blob like this. And you know, people will paint some colors on there and say, if you squint really hard, it looks like you have these different clusters. But it's not very convincing often. And you know, as I'll kind of discuss, I think a lot of the problem and why this happens is because we have so much missing data. We're not detecting the genes that we need to detect to identify what cell types we're seeing. So as I mentioned, you know, this is just to say we really, it's really important to actually identify these subtypes. Different subtypes are involved in different diseases and for example in asthma, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second, um, multiple types of T cells are actually doing multiple different things and it's really important to try and understand the, the dynamics of these cells and how they're interacting with each other. So the example I'll give, this is something from the work that I've done. I can't go into a lot of detail just because this is not released yet, but um, I'll just give you kind of the very <laughs> broad overview. So we have um, lung biopsies from people, healthy people, as well as people with asthma. And from those lung biopsies, we've sorted out CD4 positive T cells. So this is sort of what you might think of as a relatively homogeneous population of cells, but of course, as I've just told you, there's actually a very rich diversity of different cell types within that. And so what we wanted to do was break down that group of cells into, you know, diff predict different cell types and uh, figure out what, how they're changing, right? I'll give just one example in particular of Tregs, uh, also known as T regulatory cells. These are cells that perform an immune suppressive function in the body. Um, so they actually, you know, decrease the immune response when they're present and activated. Uh, so some questions we had are, is there, a, is there a difference in Treg abundance between healthy and asthma? And is there a difference in the T, within Tregs, is there a difference in their gene expression between healthy and asthma? So when I got the data back, I you know, did the standard thing, created the T-SNE plot, uh, and I painted over the known kind of canonical marker for Tregs, which is FOXP3. This is a transcription factor that's basically involved in uh, the gene expression program that creates Tregs. So of course, it's a great marker for this lineage. Um, so when I highlight the expression of FOXP3 in these cells, this is what I'm showing in the color, uh, two things pop up. So first, there aren't that many. 
uh, which is a little surprising. We kind of expected to see more Tregs in these cells than we were seeing based on FOXP3 expression. The other thing is that the, gene, the cells that are expressing this gene are not clustering together, um, which was another thing that you would kind of naively expect to happen, right? These cells should be the more similar to each other and therefore should cluster. Um, when I dug a little deeper, what I found is if I color this plot by donor, now we see what's really kind of going on is that a lot of these clusters are basically being driven by donor effects, which is most likely a batch effect. Basically, a technical, technical variability here is the strongest variability signal. The result of this is just that we can't competently identify the Tregs because you know, we don't see a lot of expression of it and we don't see clustering. So I, in an attempt to try and get some information out of this data to try and salvage it a little bit, I uh, just tried a few things, and I'll just go over sort of some things that helped. So the first thing is that, you know, since we have, we have dropout of genes, um, basically we, it's, it's better if you don't rely on just one gene to identify your cell types of interest. It's better if you use as many genes as possible. Now the problem with this normally is that, you know, people say, oh, those genes are not specific to this cell type. So, but what we can do is if we take, you know, several genes that maybe they're not all specific to the cell type, but together they're sort of indicative if they're all expressed or, you know, a lot of them are expressed, that's indicative of the cell type. We can take them all together, pull that information, and get a better prediction. The second thing is that if we focus our clustering on just the biologically relevant genes, genes that say we know are involved in T cell or just general immune biology, those genes, their variation across the cells is less likely to be dominated by technical effects because they're varying by biologi biological effects. And so this idea hopefully helps reduce the effect of the batch effects in our data uh, and sort of just kind of trying to dig out that signal from the noise. So uh, here's kind of the overall idea that I propose to do. We're going to kind of create these axes where each axis corresponds to something that we're interested in. This can be a cell type of interest, or it can actually be a function, so say uh, T cell activation or exhaustion, things like that. And we build these axes just by collecting from the literature or from you know, just biological knowledge what genes are associated with that particular idea. And we're just going to simply sum up the expression of those genes, and that will be the score for each cell along each axis. And the hope is just that when we place the cells in this space, that they will cluster together based on you know, these things that we're, we're basically trying to, uh, to assess. So when we do this, I'm showing here's what our picture was before, and here's our picture after. So we see now that we are getting clusters. Uh, and fortunately, it looks like this genes, the cells expressing FOXV3 are now actually mostly clustering together in this cluster here. The great thing about this is that, you know, if you see a, a pretty well-defined cluster where a lot of the cells express a gene of interest, you can infer that the rest of the cells in that cluster most likely are of the same cell type. It's just that they, the, the gene of interest is a dropout for those cells. So you can usually make that inference. Also reassuringly, we see that if we color by you know, the different donors, we're no longer seeing uh, the clustering being driven by the donors. If we go ahead and you know, now highlight these different uh, marker list scores that we created, um, we can see different clusters corresponding to different either biological functions or cell types. Um, so this is much more along the lines of what we were hoping to get to begin with. So now that we have this information, we can go on to actually answer those biological questions that we're really interested in, which is things like, you know, how does the number of Tregs change between these disease and healthy, and how within that cell type does the expression change? Okay, so just to wrap up, you know, I think single cell RNA-seq is an area that's definitely up and coming, and we're sort of reaching this point where we're encountering um, a lot of computational bottlenecks. You know, people, uh, people's ability to generate data is now pretty much outstripping our ability to like process it and make sense out of it. And at least part of that problem is due to just our methodologies and tools not being up to snuff. And I don't think there's anything too crazy or complex that needs to be done. It's just somebody needs to come in and like 
you know, make the tools that can handle this sort of data. Um, and I think it's gonna be very important going forward, you know, especially if we have ambitions to do things like the Human Cell Atlas, to actually take that seriously and, and work on it. And so, you know, I, I think the people in this room are better positioned than people in the average room that I, I would talk to to sort of tackle these sorts of problems. So if anyone does have interest in anything like this, please feel free at any time to talk to me. Um, I'm always happy to, to say more. So with that, I'll take any questions.